sexual assault accuser comes forward. A growing number of lawmakers explore possible impeachment. This is Outnumbered, and I'm Melissa Francis. Here today, Harris Faulkner. Fox News contributor Lisa Booth. Former Ohio Senate Democrat Minority Leader Capri Cavaro. And joining us on the couch, Fox News contributor Charlie Hurt, what? opinion editor for the Washington Times. And boy, are we happy to have you here today. Oh, man, I'm so glad. Yay. Always happy to have you. It's always good, good to, to see you. A lot to get to, so let's do it. In a new interview, Virginia Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax denied any allegations against him and again asked for the right to defend himself. This after a second accuser came forward last week. One incident allegedly occurred in 2004, and the most recent claim is of an incident at Duke University in the year 2000. Attorneys for both women say their clients would be willing to testify during impeachment proceedings. But now, despite saying that he would move to start impeachment proceedings today, Virginia Democrat delegate Patrick Hope saying he's holding off on his plans, even though he is renewing his call for Fairfax to resign immediately. Delegate Hope writing in a statement, the purpose of the additional time is so that we can find the best process to investigate these crimes with the broadest possible support. The impeachment process is about investigating to find the truth. We must allow the victims to be heard in the most fair and just process possible. And the New York Times, detailing the political stakes for Democrats in Virginia, and nationally, by the way, writing, quote, if Democrats do not oust Mr. Fairfax at a time when the party has taken a zero-tolerance stance on sexual misconduct in the Me Too era, they could anger female voters, but the specter of Mr. Fairfax being pushed out while two older white men remain in office would deeply trouble many African Americans. Boy, this is dicey, dicey territory. Um, Charlie, let me ask you, what do you think is the right forum to investigate these claims? Would it be an impeachment proceeding, or, or how, do, how do we do that if no one's pressing charges at this point in time? Well, whether it's an uh, impeachment proceeding or, or just hearings of some sort, you know, I think that that is probably the best way to do this. Um, you know, obviously these are serious charges that, are, that people are uh, talking about here. Uh, I get a little uncomfortable when people try to make the comparison between this and, and Brett Kavanaugh, though. Because, of course, these allegations are a whole lot more substantiated. You have, you have uh, women coming forward who, who are named, who, are, who, who know of a time and a place where the, the, the things that they uh, uh, allege occurred. Uh, and, and all of that is very different from Brett Kavanaugh. That said, um, I still think that uh, Justin Fairfax is, uh, is owed some sort of due process. And so just the mere allegations is not enough. And so whatever the, the venue is, some kind of investigation where the public gets to, to, to see an airing of these allegations, as well as his forceful defense of it, yeah. um, I think is vitally important. Capri, um, do Democrats have a stake or bear a burden going forward in how it's sorted out who stays and who goes? Or is this one state Mm -hmm. and one set of problems, and it's unfair to sort of extrapolate it out to all Democrats. Well, I think it's, it's one state, and it's one very important state in the 2020 electoral map. I mean, Virginia has developed into a more purple state because of uh, the northern Virginia growth uh, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and it's a state that Hillary Clinton won back in 2016. So if Democrats are marred in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it could have a potential impact in 2020. My point is this. As a former state legislator, um, you know, for a decade, you know, these the, the three people at the top of, of Virginia, and I know we'll get into you know some of that a little bit later, but what is happening, with the, the longer they stick around, the more that they are distracting from their job, the more that, that this is not good for the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And to me, I think it's very selfish. I think all three of them should go, and I think that if Justin Fairfax wants to pursue, pursue any kind of due process, then they can go through either a civil proceeding or a criminal proceeding in, in the court process. Let's move on, and I don't care if there's a Republican governor. People need, in Virginia need to get back to work. Okay. If no one invites you to their holiday party, yeah, I was going to say. Friends, you can have some but here, no, but let me tell you Democrat something, though. Will take you. you know, but here the caveat is: it's a it's a one-term governor in Virginia. It's true. So it's you got true. two well, years, take him out. And that's precisely the reason why, at least with Northam, he's probably not going to step down because he is a one-term governor. There's nowhere else for him to go politically. Democrat senators Kane and Warner aren't going anywhere, so his political career was likely going to end anyways. But what makes it difficult for Democrats in the state, not just for 2020. 
also the statewide uh, legislative races that are coming up this November. Mm. And elections have consequences. And you look at even another issue that Northam has come under fire for over his abortion comments. That's at issue, too, this November. Because if you look, the Virginia House of Delegates, I think Republicans have a, a three-seat majority in the state Senate, it's two. Uh, so that bill very well could pass if Democrats take back the state legislature. And we saw mm. that happen in New York with their third trimester abortion bill because Republicans were blocking it in the state Senate. Republicans lost that majority in the state Senate, and then they were able to move forward with that. So that's also at so stake. Your green goes so November. the Democrats get protected and can do better uh, in the cycle. So with the question, that's your, that's your position. The, the way that. I've read it, and it's been explained by legal experts to me, though, is that to impeach somebody in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it has to be for some infraction that has happened while that person was in office. So I don't think that's the case in either of the situations with these accusers. They date back to 2000 and 2004. The other thing is the statute of limitations. Why are they talking about it, though? In, uh, why are they talking they about impeachment? Back, yeah. I, I, why, why does anybody talk about impeachment? Why well, do they, they talk about it with I, President I, I, Trump? Because you could argue that you can impeach for, many, for any reason. Right. What you can do a start a procedure right. and that becomes enough of a distraction that you can force some things to happen but the but the laws the way that it works in the Commonwealth of Virginia is whatever the infraction is has to have happened while they were a member in the office however you've got Massachusetts and I think North Carolina where these things happen so the statute of limitations have they run out are those the proper venues for investigations and hearings I don't know and, well and the fact that uh, charges have not been pressed in either of those places tells you something uh, but I do think that uh, that uh, uh, you know, the, the important thing here is, and this is true, uh, ha has always been true, this is not a Democrat thing or a Republican thing. It ought to be looked at as a justice Hashtag thing. Hashtag me too thing. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess. Uh, although that's, I feel like that in a lot of ways has been perverted uh, for political purposes as well, as well. This is, it's it's about right and wrong. It's about justice. Mm -hmm. And and if we don't look at if we look at it through the lens of Democrats or Republicans, like Capri says, you know, it, it shouldn't be, a, it should be a bipartisan thing. And and the, the same bar should, uh, of, of uh, guilt should be whether you're a Democrat Why or a Republican. Why do you think it isn't? I would say that I think that Democrats have a, uh, a terrible history lately of uh, playing a lot of politics with these sorts of allegations. And, uh, and it's very disturbing and, it's, and it, it's destructive and it tears the country apart. All right. Senator Amy Klobuchar becomes the latest Democratic woman to enter the race for the White House. And she's already battling claims that she's a mean boss. What the senator is saying about this and whether male candidates ever get the mean label. Plus, Senator Elizabeth Warren and her defenders taking aim at President Trump over his mocking of the senator's ancestry claims. We'll debate whether the senator is ever going to put that controversy behind her. Elizabeth Warren has made herself a laughing stock, and I don't think anybody should be surprised that, that that's been the reaction to, to her and to her continued claims. before you as the granddaughter of an iron ore miner, as the daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, as the first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota, to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. That's Senator Amy Klobuchar formally announcing her 2020 presidential bid, the Minnesota Democrat positioning herself as the Midwest common sense answer to President Trump. But before she even took the stage in snowy Minneapolis, which is exactly how I remember February when I was there, <laughs> she was hit by reports of former employees describing her as a difficult boss who mistreated them. Politico ran this headline, Klobuchar's opening pitch sidetracked by staff horror stories. The senator addressed the allegations earlier today. I love my staff. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am and we wouldn't be able to pass all those bills and do all that work if we didn't have great staff. I am tough. I push people. That is true. But my point is, is that I have high expectations for myself. I have high expectations for the people that work for me. And I have high expectations for this country. 
Current and former Klobuchar staffers have publicly gone on the record now to push back against the allegations, some suggesting the critiques are grounded in sexism. One former staffer said this, quote, I've heard people say she's tough to work for, and I sometimes cringe when I hear it because I rarely hear that said about male bosses in Congress, despite the fact that half of Congress is tough to work for. Senator Klobuchar is probably the most brilliant, hardworking person I've had the privilege to work for, end quote. Charlie, you know Washington well. Uh, it is a tough place to work in general. It, does that former staffer have a point? Is it sexism or something else? You know, I, I always get a little queasy about these uh, inside political hit jobs from anor anonymous sources uh, on the eve of somebody announcing their, their intention to point. run for, for president. Obviously, you know, there's a difference between being a tough boss and being some sort of monster. Uh, if somebody is some kind of monster and that, and that, that generally tends to come out in a campaign, um, then that usually hurts them pretty badly. But I find this sort of, th this kind of sniping in, you know, uh, you know it's, it's a Washington hit job. And I think the biggest reason uh, why uh, we see this right now is because I think a lot of people fear, a lot of Democrats, a lot of liberal progressive Democrats in Washington fear somebody like Amy Klobuchar because she is not part of the more radical sort of mm. progressive wing of the party, and they yeah. don't want to give up. Well, Minnesota in general, they've got the, the Democrat yeah. Farmers League. I mean, it's, I know because I covered politics there. It's a very different political animal. You can have Walter yeah. Mondale in, in one neighborhood and Jesse Ventura in another. Yeah, and, you know, and, and if you want, if Democrats want to, to win back those voters that Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump in those uh, working class uh, uh, Midwestern mm -hmm. states, they're going to do it with somebody like Amy Klobuchar, not with somebody like Elizabeth Warren. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I heard you kind of chiming in there. Former aides, Melissa, are speaking anonymously about, you know, fear of retribution described as toxic office in environment, including demeaning emails and the such. That's speaking to what Charlie's saying, not on the record necessarily. It does. It, I mean, it feels like a bit of a hit job, even if it's true in some way. And she is a tough boss only because it flies in the face of the image that she's put out there. Even right. if you look at her mm. presentation where it says Amy and she's kind of, you know, put forward as this, you know, aw shucks kind of candidate is something people keep saying. And that would undermine that and go against it. But it does also have a sexist feel to me because it feels like, um, you know, like somebody's driving down the road of she's not like and they know yeah. that's worked on other women and so they kind of that's what it starts to feel like it's see not, I disagree I don't think it's sexist I actually think that it's sexist to believe that as a woman somehow you should be insulated from these kinds of attacks and Melissa's right the reason why this could impact her her 2015 memoir is the senator next door her whole shtick is that I'm this you know Midwestern nice yeah. I'm relatable and so if these stories which she does have the highest turn, turnover rate on Capitol Hill or at least in the Senate rather which as someone who's spent time on Capitol Hill that does say something about the kind of person right. she is to work for. So if her demeanor behind the scenes is completely contradictory to how she presents herself publicly, right. that is going to hurt her. And I also think another problem that she is going to face is the fact that she is just kind of boring. And when you look at the fact that there's going to be an incredibly competitive Democratic primary field, how does someone like her, that's sort of a bland yeah. politician, break through? So she so adds Sharon on... Brown to the ticket. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that's, if I could just though. slice in that she's the third highest, just real quick. It, at one point, she was the okay, highest, you, but Melissa, overall... Okay. It's the third. Just right. to make Chris sure we Van Hollen so from Maryland actually. One, one of the quickest ways that the other 16 candidates among the Republicans against then candidate Donald J. Trump could get their names in the headlines is if he sort of elevated them in a tweet or something of the like. And so the president actually didn't go after this story because I don't think it had happened yet. But she was clearly being snowed upon. And the president talked about <laughs> her visions on climate change. And all oh, of a sudden, gosh. I mean, she was trending on Twitter. I mean, it, and I don't say that to make a joke, but you talk about her being boring. And can she take on a President Trump? I thought it was interesting well, it's, that it's a stark contrast. It's a very, very stark contrast. And I hear what you're saying. I mean, that obviously brings that attention to her. The second that President Trump pays she attention, she wasn't bringing it everybody, to herself. Everybody starts to pay attention. I think you bring up a good point. Is this an inside job? Is it a Democratic inside job versus does a Republican matter? job? I think it does actually, because I think that there is a schism. Lisa's head shaking. I don't think it does. I, well, I think it. I think it does just w internally with the Democratic dynamics, because if we don't put forward someone who is electable in the in the mm -hmm. fall. We shoot ourselves in the, in the she, foot. She made, and a, she made a okay. point to thank her staff in the speech, which tells you everything that her, her and her, she is concerned about this hitting and I having an know. impact Messaging. on her. Right. I don't know about that. Mm. Senator Elizabeth Warren slamming President Trump right out of the gate after officially announcing her run for the White House this weekend. Some pretty tough stuff coming from the Massachusetts senator. Watch this.
By the time we get to 2020, Donald Trump may not even be president. In fact, he may not even be a free person. But Warren making no mention of the renewed controversy over past claims of Native American heritage. The Trump campaign firing back, issuing a statement calling Warren a fraud. And the president mockingly asking on Twitter if Warren will run as our first Native American presidential candidate. That bringing a quick response from another Democratic 2020 hopeful, Kirsten Gillibrand, who reportedly said, quote, President Trump's name calling, it's irresponsible, it's unpresidential. Senator Warren has been an extraordinary public servant, and I think the way Trump treats public servants, the way he treats women, particularly women of color, is outrageous. It's both sexist and racist. But Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney says Senator Warren has made herself an object of mockery. Elizabeth Warren has made herself a laughingstock, and I don't think anybody should be surprised that, that that's been the reaction to, to her and to her continued claims. And we saw just last week, uh, you know, that she, she said she was a Native American on her application for membership in at least one state bar association. I think the longer that she's out there, uh, the more that people are going to be talking about this. And, and it's just, it's clear that you know, she's somebody who can't be trusted. In the meantime, a Cherokee Nation expert calling into MSNBC to blast Senator Warren. Watch this. Yeah, Elizabeth Warren did, in fact, have a Native American ancestor. So um, that's completely false. Who Warren's family is is not a mystery. She comes from a well, from a line of very well documented white people going back to before the Trail of Tears. She's been approached by Cherokee people now for the past six years with strong evidence that the story that she was told as a family isn't true. Mm -hmm. And she's continued to tell it. Oh, goodness, Charlie. I mean, I think that the, the problem this has is that she just continues to seem so disingenuous. If she just yeah. said, this is the story I was told, I believed it at the time. Yeah, I put yeah. it on applications. I thought it would but help she me. She said that in an ad in 2012. And this came back because she brought it back. And, the, and this, the whole thing is the problem with, with Democrats playing this whole thing about identity politics. Mm. And, and, and in this country, we have, have, have strived to learn to, uh, from Martin Luther King to move on beyond these things and judge people on the content of their character and not the color of their skin or whatever. But this, this, this impulse in, in politics, it's the only industry where, where it's still allowed, where racial profiling is, is not only allowed, but it's encouraged. Uh, and and, and the, these, these people who slice and dice the electorate by race, gender, creed, and everything, and then tailor messages for all those different groups, uh, it's, it's offensive and it's destructive to the country. And, and, and not only was she doing that by claiming Native American heritage, but then she went to go feed at the trough for uh, these, these uh, 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 programs set up to help people who are historically disadvantaged. It's disgusting, and people don't like it. I, I have a question on the heels of what Charlie has said for you, Capri. And, and this isn't to take down the entire, you know, ideas that your party may have for economics. But, you know, when you talk about identity politics uh -huh. and you come, up pe come toward people of color, Democrats are not taking in tow the message that this president is taking right now. And that's going to be tough in 2020. Lowest unemployment in right. five decades, that sort of. I mean, can we just get back to those things that would matter to us no matter what the color of our skin and make it about the color of opportunity in green? Well, and I think that anyone that is going to be successful in 2020 is going to have to focus on just those things, those quote unquote kitchen table issues. And I think one of the challenges of this very crowded yet diverse field, on one hand, it's great because it's showing that, you know, a lot of people think that it is possible, regardless of your gender or ethnic background or color of your skin, that you can run for president of the United States. That's great. On the flip side, in a Democratic primary, you are cutting up the field in an identity politics way. where you Don't make it about running for the White House. Make it about getting a job I, oh, that look, pays I, so and well my point your is, dreams I are coming I agree with through. that. We need to transcend that. That's the only way we're going to be successful. And I will say one more thing. we got too many senators in this race. If these folks really cared about giving a check and balance to President Trump, people like him, Elizabeth Warren, their voices would be better served staying as a United States senator rather point. than like Listen toiling in the primary. The so, and I also, um, well, I, I think Elizabeth Warren has also demonstrated that she's not ready to challenge President Trump because he has already been able to goad her into doing a whole campaign troll rollout her. to tell yeah, yeah. Troll her into telling the entire country that she is less Native American <laughs> than the average white person. So he has already been able to do this. So she is not ready for to challenge President Trump. And the, for, just to clarify something, 
Klobuchar was the highest turnover rate in the Senate from 2001 to 2016. Okay, I, got that. I knew I got it from somewhere, yeah, and I wanted to make sure a, that I clarified that. That's a long <laughs> span. Yeah, that is a long span. It's long, yeah. All right. Uh, time running out to avoid another shutdown. The new demands from Democrats that could scuttle a bipartisan deal on border security. Plus, he says he's here to stay, but with a gaffe by Virginia's Democratic governor, Ralph Northam could, could complicate his push for a reset. Right now, Virginia needs someone that can heal. Virginia also needs someone who is strong, who has empathy, who has courage, and who has a moral compass. And that's why I'm not going anywhere. From here, uh, in 1619, the first uh, indentured servants from Africa landed on our shores in Old Point Comfort, what we call now Fort Monroe. And while... Also known as slavery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, how Gail kept a straight face there. Uh, back now to the political turmoil in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where Governor Ralph Northam vows to stay on the job and help his state heal because he's a doctor. But he's off to a bumpy start. And his first on-camera interview since the firestorm erupted over blackface photos in his past yearbook, Northam referred to the Commonwealth's first slaves as indentured servants, as you saw Gail King correcting him there. Uh, the governor attempted to clarify in the statement, quote, a historian advised me that the use of uh, indentured was more accurate. The fact is I'm still learning and committed to getting it right, end quote. Reaction to the governor's misstep has been fierce. A spokesperson for Virginia's Republican Party saying, quote, is the governor so tone deaf on racism that he can't even use the word slave? He has no moral authority to lead any healing process. The first step in the healing, the Commonwealth would be uttering two simple words. I resign, end quote. And this from the Commonwealth's chapter of the NAACP. Quote, NAACP leaders, pastors, community, and many other leaders across Virginia demand that Ralph Northam immediately resigns as governor, end quote. Uh, I saw a lot of head, just, just overall activity <laughs> over there. Capri, what is going on? Um, my head, like, explodes over this. I mean, I can't understand anyone, particularly someone who is the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, that is, that, as the, the GOP just said, I mean, first of all, you've got the GOP and the NAACP in agreement that the guy needs to go. How can you possibly say that slavery is indentured servitude? I mean, it's just uh, unbelievable. I, I am just beside well, myself. Well, he said he was educated as well, such okay, but, on that matter but, and I mean, is now really? still learning. I mean, and how can I'm you still I'm only answering be, what he said. But how can you still be learning when you are six, 59 years old and and the governor of a state that was the previous capital of the Confederacy. I've only had one question, Charlie, for the governor. <laughs> I've only had one. And it wouldn't matter that he took responsibility and then backseas took it back. Right. Um, but if you had the nickname Kuhnman also on your yearbook page underneath your name, how many times did you dress up in bigoted gear in order for people to see you that way? It's a, it's a simple question. If you first took responsibility for the original photo, was it also because you knew you'd done it more than once, which, in fact, you had? Yeah. No, you know, I, I mean, I, I grew up in Virginia, and I grew up, uh, you know, during the 80s. And, you know, the, the idea that somehow that was acceptable uh, or people didn't know in the, in the 80s that that was uh, something that was offensive uh, that, that just doesn't, it, that, that doesn't pass. Um, and, and furthermore, you know, this is, it's not like the guy was in high school or something. The guy was in medical school. I, don't, I, I really, it's just sort of uh, pales, uh, it, it's beyond the imagination that, that he would have uh, thought that this was not something that was clearly offensive uh, to people. So, Lisa, I, I also see a lot of head bobbing over there. I mean, you oh, guys gosh. have a lot of nonverbal today. Well, <laughs> <laughs> We're just giving it all away with uh, our facial expressions and... Well, so as someone who's worked in political communications, just watching this guy is a train wreck. Watching the press conference that he originally gave, I thought it was some sort of SNL parody. And then I don't understand who on his staff thought it was a good idea for him to ever sit down in front of the cameras. This is a guy who is going to moonwalk at the press conference until his wife told him inappropriate circumstances. So this is a guy who needs to just, you know, go away, hide out, not be in front of the cameras. He clearly does not make his case. But I think what is the most difficult for Democrats in the state of Virginia right now is the fact that you have three of your top elected officials that are all facing and embroiled in their own Two scandals. in this category. Right, and so it's when there's three, this lane. someone among those three is likely going to have to step down. So who is it going to be? So you brought up the Michael Jackson costume, and only because you brought that up, right. our, our team has this, uh, this word from the Virginia governor on it. Let's watch. 
I dressed up as, as Michael Jackson. I put some uh, shoe polish on my oh, cheeks. I went to military school, military college for four years. I polished my shoes almost every day. Uh, we did that with what we call a spit shine rag. It's a very thin piece of cloth. And the my dad shoe used polish. To do that, yeah. Yes. And mm -hmm. the shoe polish goes through that cloth and it gets on your finger or my finger and it's very difficult to remove. I'm not sure why he was giving us a primer on how to dress in blackface, but we got one anyway. Uh, the Washington Post poll finds that Virginians overall are completely divided on this issue. Can we pop that up? Should Governor Northam step down? 47% say yes. 47% say no. Six have no opinion. Also, uh, well, well, we'll leave it there and just get your response. Rule. I'm, I can't get past that interview with Gail. I don't know how she sat there, and I just, everything he said was just more shocking sort of than the last. I mean, if you've read any history books at all, there's a huge difference between being an indentured servant and being a slave. I, or I mean, if you how, just have a dictionary. Yeah, I mean, how he could claim that anyone told him that those were even remotely the same things is and then to explain with the cloth as if that somehow helps the argument. Yeah, what, where was it's that just going? Staggering. It's just hard to get off your face. Be split is that why on whether or not he should go? I, I went. I went to military school. I had to shine my shoes, and this was never an urge on anyone's part to then uh, put it on your face. Yeah, you know, exactly. I, I I know we popped this up there, and I didn't want to glaze over it. The watch down among whites and blacks. And I just want to get a quick word from Capri right now. Uh, you've got about almost 20% of the voting electric and population in Virginia is African American. Mm -hmm. this, this number is moving, though, and you have 59% who are saying among blacks, uh, no. And you can look at it on the screen there. Uh, should step down, should not step down. Why do you think that is, knowing the voting electorate as it is in Virginia? Uh, that's, I, I honestly can't speak to that. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty surpri surprising number to me, at least, that the African-American community in Virginia would say that, that he should not step down. Um, I Teachable would, moment? I mean, I, I would defer, and I know that there's been some, you know, it, within the entertainment community that has said it's a teachable moment, but I'll defer to the Virginians. So the no, next no, 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 time no, no, no. that it happens oh, okay. for someone in the opposition party or an independent or whatever, I just wonder what the responses would well, be. I, but I, I, I'll, t I'll tell you, I think the reason that there, there is that disparity is because among uh, white Virginia voters, uh, they do find this uh, uh, maybe not more offensive, but they are more careful about it because they uh, have learned over the years that this is not this is something that is offensive, and and they don't and they don't want to be judged as a common and they law. don't want to be judged, but they also don't want to be offending people. That's it, uh, Virginia is a very genteel place. It's, the, it's sort of like the last place of gen, where genteel politics. And if there's any political karma that comes out of this, it's the fact that uh, Ralph Northam. Uh, ran a campaign two years ago accusing Ed Gillespie, who is not a racist, and there's no evidence to suggest anything like that. Uh, he played the game of racial politics and accused him of being a racist. And for him to now be on this, uh, the, the horns of this dilemma is uh, perhaps karma. All right. No doubt we'll continue to have a conversation as this stays in the news at this point. Amid reports that talks have stalled now, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are scrambling to get a deal done on border security before Friday's deadline. Can they come up with something the president would sign, or are we headed for another partial government shutdown? Lawmakers are meeting later today, facing a deadline this Friday to avert another partial government shutdown. They are trying to reach a deal on border security, but negotiations apparently hit a roadblock over the weekend. The stalemate is over Democrats' proposal for new restrictions on immigration and customs enforcement, forcing the agency to prioritize detaining only undocumented immigrants with criminal records. But President Trump not buying it, tweeting this morning, the Democrats do not want us to detain or send back criminal aliens. This is a brand new demand. Crazy. Over the weekend, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham likewise accused Democrats of incentivizing crime and endangering the country. Listen. The president should never, in my opinion, sign a bill that reduces bed space for violent offenders because that puts the country at risk. It incentivizes more violent people to come to the United States. It's a signal that we're not taking violent of, uh, offenders seriously in America. But Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan pushing back, denying that his party is in any way sympathetic to violent criminals.
I think a lot of other people aren't for releasing violent offenders in any regard. That doesn't sound like something that uh, I would be supportive of or many, many Democrats would be supportive of. I don't think the border wall is immoral. I just think it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think we have technologies that are much better equipped to handle what's happening here. And tonight, the president is holding a political rally in El Paso, Texas, where he claims the border wall reduced crime. But FBI stats don't back that up. He's expected to push for funding for his border wall. And former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke will take part in a counter rally at the same time, which is also in El Paso. Capri, let me start with the first issue here. Yeah. Um, the idea of reducing the bed space. Mm -hmm. Was that a new demand put out at the end meant to torpedo this deal as it seemed like it was getting close to getting done? I don't know if it was, you know, put out there to necessarily torpedo the deal. I mean, I think that on its face, limiting the beds is, you know, somewhat of a reasonable demand um, because it's it's there to try to uh, create a checks and balance so it's not overused. But I also think conversely, the Republicans asking for violent criminals to be exempt from that bed cap is also a reasonable request as well. So, I mean, I think that at this point, what I think that at least Democratic leadership might be doing, and I have no insider information, but this is just my assumption here, that I think what's happening is that they're just assuming there's not a taste for another government shutdown. So what they're going to do is they're going to say, OK, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi is going to say, you go ahead and you do this, uh, you know, um, emergency. It's going to end up being litigated in the courts. You're not going to get your wall. And and then it's the ball is in his court. I, I mean, I think that that's risky on behalf of Nancy yeah. Pelosi. Um, but I think that may be where they're coming from. Interesting. Uh, I've got an update from Chad Program, our Washington, D.C. producer on Capitol Hill. Uh, he writes with negotiations stalled. Now we expect the chairs and ranking members of the House and Senate appropriations panels to meet. Now they've just decided and announced a 3.30 p.m. Eastern meeting once lawmakers are back in town. Uh, that's the good. key here. The, yeah. Uh, OK. So the key here. But this is the thing, is to avoid that partial government shutdown from happening Saturday morning, not so much on forging a deal on border security. Are we moving away from getting a deal done and just trying to keep the government open again, Charlie? Well, I think if, if Democrats and, and leadership now are talking about um, uh, taking away bed space uh, to detain uh, violent criminals, then by all means we're moving away from any kind of a deal. Remember, before now, the whole notion of, uh, of abolishing ICE, it, it was still sort of a fringe left thing that was in the, in the, in the left uh, part of the Democratic Party. If now Democrats are talking about removing bed space, that means if you can't hold uh, people, you can't deport them. That is, in effect, abolishing ICE. This is a whole new world now that we're talking about. And if that's the new, uh, the, the, the new um, demand by Democrats, we're not going to get a deal at all because I don't think the president will ever go along with that. The other thing that I love is listening to politicians in Washington talk about, uh, well, the wall, the, the, the only problem with the wall is it doesn't work. And it's like, are you kidding me? You've had 35 years to get this problem fixed, and your complaint is that the wall doesn't work? Why, why haven't no, you fixed it before? No, Tim was saying we have better things Lisa, to get the thing. Okay, so real, quick, you, real quick, you also have um, two shares group that have now written a letter to Congress saying that this would lead to 8,300 criminals being released on the streets and also over 90 percent of the individuals that ICE detains ha either have criminal records or have been previously deported. So it's not just Republicans that are criticizing capping ICE beds. And keep it right here on Fox all day and all night. After the president holds his rally in El Paso, he will sit down with Laura Ingram, that interview airing at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Ingram Angle. Reaction continues to pour in after progressives unveil their Green New Deal. But not all Democrats are on board. Meantime, Republicans are pouncing on the far-left proposal, and they believe it boosts their 2020 chances. We'll debate it next. They will ban being able to cook out, ban cows, basically. This is nuts. Numbered in just a moment, but first, let's check in with Harris and see what's coming up on overtime just a few minutes from now. Harris. Well, that situation in Virginia, the scandal there continues to heat up the controversy surrounding Virginia's top three Democrats, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi now, insisting this will not affect the Democrat Party nationally in 2020. But some White House hopefuls.